Jonathan B., how's everything going? Going well. Excited to be back. Back on the show. <laughs> yeah, back to talk about uh, one of our favorite topics, uh, envy of all things. And, of course, this is um, you know, a big thing in the Bitcoin community, you know, especially during bull markets as price goes up and so on. It's a lot of people that get envious but can't really show it. And oftentimes it's very latent and hidden or they think they're hiding it. Oftentimes it's patently obvious. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk to you because uh, you're a philosopher and you've uh, you've studied a lot of great philosophers. And it turns out that envy is a major motivation uh, of the human condition, I suppose, and uh, why philosophers write so much about it. Um, but can you can you tell us a little bit more about maybe your background and what what uh, you know what you're thinking uh, with respect to you know what you study and so on? So one way to tell my story uh, mm -hmm. with regards to envy is that mm -hmm. I got into philosophy because of an envy of a bull, Bitcoin bulk cycle, specifically uh -huh. the bull cycle of uh, 2017. So mm -hmm. I was a college um, uh, uh, under, uh, undergrad at the time, mm -hmm. and I was doing computer science. I had dropped out, I had tried to build a company, and I had failed. When I got back, I had hit the bull cycle of 2017, where a lot of my good friends hit it big in uh, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin at the time. And I was envious, but I couldn't really articulate that. And so I wanted to argue that uh, essentially Bitcoin and technology itself was stupid. And <laughs> philosophy, meditation, all these otherworldly traditions, including Gerard and Christianity, was a tool to argue that. that you know, what you guys have, you know, that, that kind of sucks. What I have, <laughs> philosophy, otherworldliness, meditation. I, I, I gone to a, a monastery in, in Nepal, a Tibetan monastery in Nepal to practice. Um, that's the real stuff. And so unbeknownst to me, I think envy drove me away from something that I was, I was really after, uh, which was financial freedom, um, mm. to philosophy. <laughs> and so I, of course, took philosophy very seriously, and I liked philosophy for its own sake. But the degree to which... I rejected the world I don't think was healthy at all. And I think I missed a lot of potentially life-changing opportunities, including the 2017 bull run, um, because of that. So yes, I do agree with you that uh, envy in the bull run is a very big issue. And uh, it's something I am personally probably most fascinated by in the realm of, of philosophy. Um, the mm. authors that I'm most attracted to, people like Nietzsche, like Gerard, like uh, Rousseau, are uh, Augustine um, is another example all have uh, very interesting things to say about it. In fact, they're, also, they're often quite central. It's often quite central um, to their philosophies. Now, maybe one thing I'll say here, since you asked about you know, envy in general in philosophy, mm. is that across all these philosophers, what envy shows them is that humans are radically social creatures. And I think mm. something you said best is, in the bull market, people tend to get envious, which is weird, because in the bull market, people also tend to get very rich. So what that reveals is that what envy, people who are envious care a lot more about their relative standing, their social standing relative to a peer group, let's say, or a reference or benchmark than they do the absolute amount, right? And I think in bull markets, we all see this. You're 3xing your Bitcoin, but your friend's shitcoin 100xs, and suddenly you feel bad about yourself. So I think that's the overarching, overarching insight across these philosophers. Uh, about what envy reveals for us. That envy mm. reveals that we're deeply social creatures who often care more about our relative standing than what we absolutely have. Hmm. And, and that's an in interesting point, that um, despite philosophy having sort of this ivory tower reputation, that it is very much concerned with how humans interact with one another. You would think that if you're looking at like the great truths of the universe, that humans would play a very small role. Yet practically speaking envy is a very big part of every everyone's experience and like having to deal with it is obviously a big thing uh, so how do philosophers just sort of make envy out to be i don't know like uh, how how do they place it uh how do they place um you know human relationships and so on and what how do they assign it importance i guess yeah so let me um, 
maybe answer that by by giving um, an example, and it has to do with what you said that you think philosophy is the study of the world's most profound truths about metaphysics and what exists and what is justice, and not you know. Um, not like schoolgirl, schoolboy rivalries in, in, in high school. But for, again, this is not all philosophy. I don't think you can make any uh, statements about all philosophy. But for the philosophers I'm really interested in, Gerard, Rousseau, Nietzsche, um, envy actually shapes our view of all those things. It can even shape our view of metaphysics, the deepest truths mm-hmm. of the universe. Let me give you an example. So in one of Nietzsche's very famous works, Twilight of the Idols, he asks... Why does Socrates like ideas so much, right? Socrates, of course, is mm-hmm. thought to be the father of Western philosophy, right? The greatest mind mm-hmm. in Athens. Why does Socrates, you know, famously elevates a realm of ideas, right? For Socrates, uh, this book right here is not really fully real. What's really real is the form of the book, the idea of the book, which this book is merely one instantiation. Mm-hmm. And Nietzsche's answer is that Socrates is an ugly plebe. <laughs> so he, Socrates is an ugly loser. And what he means by that is, look, Socrates was, was famously very ugly, that he had a pig's nose. And, mm-hmm. and I think Nietzsche would want to say, look, if I had the biggest brain but ugliest nose in all of Athens, I'd mm-hmm. also spend my time thinking about ideas all the time, right? The classical thing to relate to is nerds in the high school usually aren't 10 out of 10 the most beautiful people. And he'd say that, look, if I had the biggest brain in all of Athens, I too would want to suggest the philosopher king, right? This is when one of Socrates' proposals, that philosophers should be kings. And so um, Nietzsche thinks that envy and our social relationships um, determines actually or can greatly influence and direct um, what we think about the most important issues of the world, including things like metaphysics, what, what is there, including things like justice what are good mm. values. And so, for the, again, for the authors that I'm really interested in, um, that's how central it is. Envy and other social desires like it really color the, color the way we engage with the entire world. Mm. Well, that, that example of Socrates uh, and Nietzsche's critique uh, is especially like familiar to, I think, anybody where... Uh, you know, you, you can sort of discount somebody's opinion essentially because it's self-serving in some way. Um, is that a common thing? Is, is, is that Nietzsche's position that all sort of <laughs> like beliefs uh, ultimately rise up from sort of like a self-serving um, way of placing themselves higher somehow above other people? Yeah, so um, I think always is too strong. Mm. But I think what Nietzsche wants to say is, more often than not, we, many of us hold beliefs to extend, to actualize what he calls our will to power. Now, now the thing I, I need to preface with Nietzsche is, is, unlike Rousseau and Girard, where there's a lot of scholarly debates, there's even more scholarly debates with Nietzsche. And he mm. famously writes in this very dense and, and hard to understand aphoristic, it's very entertaining to read, form. Um, so, so everything I'm going to say about Nietzsche is one interpretation. Um, mm. But, but I do want to slightly modify something that you said, mm-hmm. which is it's not that the beliefs are self-serving in the sense that Socrates says, I want to gain power, therefore I'm going to suggest the philosopher king. It's not as even conscious to the subject. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So envy can, can, can push you in different directions even without you knowing it. And mm-hmm. again, going back to my personal example, of rejecting technology and blockchain Mm. in early 2017, Mm. I wasn't wasn't thinking explicitly, okay? Mm. I'm gonna use philosophy to attack technology and and to to be cooler than my peers. (laughs) But that's where envy led me to. Does that make sense? So Mm -hmm. so oftentimes from the subjective perspective, um, envy is still, uh, envy operates even unbeknownst to you. And mm. l- let me give you the most extreme example of just how much envy determines for, for Nietzsche. Mm. And this mm. has to do with uh, his famous uh, genealogy of morals, which is one of mm. the first lectures I'm going to release in my lecture series, and we'll link it below if people are interested. And it's, mm. it's essentially a desire to t- talk, about, talk about the origin of not just Christianity, but egalitarianism. So the question mm. for Nietzsche is, where did Christianity come from? Where did things like equality come from? And you might think, well, why is that an important question? Like, surely that's just a good value. 
But if you look at the Greco-Roman world, right, what are they like? Mm. They like glory. They like pride. They like wealth. Mm. They like youth and beauty and killing each other. And so mm. our value system is very different. And mm. Nietzsche's answer, very shortly, of how that came about is envy. Is that mm. the people who are weak and meek, the slaves, he, 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 not necessarily like actual slaves, but people who are Slavish, um, mm. basically turned the Greco-Roman values on its head. So for Nietzsche, Christianity and egalitarianism, even that, the reason it spread so much is because um, individuals were envious of the rich and powerful, the, the masters is what he calls. So that is how much envy can determine the social world for Nietzsche. Mm. Well, so his philosophy is um, obviously groundbreaking. Like, no one really thought of things the way he did. Um, but the thing that I always kind of get stuck on Nietzsche is, uh, you know, what, what's the ultimate good with his, you know, will to power, you know, Ubermensch or, you know, the, the, the uh, I guess, the genius or the, the, the Superman or whatever, whatever you want to call it. It, it doesn't really make sense for anyone to support that unless you're part of that group. It, it, it never, uh, it, it, it seemed always to me sort of like an aristocratic, uh, like sort of almost Machiavellian justification for, um, you know, being a master over slaves or something like that. And, and of course, like we could put his own sort of analysis to his own philosophy. He, he wants to be part of the elite, so he sort of gives us a justification. Here's my contribution, so you can place me up high, which many people do. Um, you know, it, it never really seems that convincing to me. It, it always seems like sort of like a rationalization for what he wants. Right, right. So Jimmy, I might have a, Nietzsche might have bad news for you, and he might say, <laughs> you know, that that might mean you're not a master, and and you know who you are if you're not a master. So. Um, Okay, this is the serious answer. And again, I'm going to preface mm. this. This is one interpretation mm. of Nietzsche. Mm. I've been taught to interpret Nietzsche as a an an moral anti-realist. Mm. And wh what that means, essentially, is that he doesn't think there's objective truths about moral values. Mm. So when, you say, when we say something like slavery is just or unjust or abortion is right or wrong, we think we're making an objective statement, right? Like, like dinosaurs roam the earth. Like, there's a yes, no, like question there. But Nietzsche thinks that when we say something like that, it's really just expressing a taste. So when you say abortion is right or wrong, you're saying something like, I like vanilla over chocolate. And it's a subjective taste. And so in that world where foundational moral evaluation are subjective tastes, Nietzsche does think we end up in the world you're describing in where some people are just not going to be convinced and have no reason to be convinced. Does that make sense? So, so mm -hmm. Nietzsche doesn't think that everyone will like his philosophy. Nietzsche's position, again, this reading, specific reading, mm -hmm. thinks that Nietzsche's position is Nietzsche likes what he calls higher men, and, and these are the creative geniuses of the world. Sometimes he includes the conquerors like Napoleon, but mostly it's Beethoven, Shakespeare, uh, Goethe, people like that. Um, and Nietzsche wants to produce more of them. Mm -hmm. And what Nietzsche thinks is holding back the production of these geniuses is envy and the type of morality it leads to, which is mm -hmm. all the forms of egalitarian morality. Does that, make, does, does that start to make mm -hmm. more sense? So from his perspective, he's saying, look, I want higher men, and, I'm, and maybe I can use my rhetoric to convince other people to want higher men, and j just like I can give you vanilla ice cream and maybe you'll like it. <laughs> but I don't think I can rationally convince everyone to want higher men. And if mm. you don't want higher men, then, you know, we're, we're, this is a battle of values, right? Mm. So the, the famous sentence he has in, in the genealogy is Rome against Judea, Rome representing the Greco-Roman world, Judea re representing the Judeo-Christian world, Rome mm. against Judea, Judea against Rome. There's been no greater battle than this. So for Nietzsche, <laughs> values are not rational, something you and I can discuss through. It, it's a battle. And sometimes you can win this battle through physical force. Other times you can win this battle through rhetorical force, the brilliance of your speech, which is why Nietzsche writes in the aphoristic way that he does. Mm. And in, indeed, he, uh, <laughs> he, he, he's become way more popular uh, over the last uh, century or so. Um, particularly, right. I, I think you mentioned 
Uh, Freud was uh, significantly influenced through him, and I, I couldn't help uh, drawing that sort of like connection when I when I was listening to your lecture about how a lot of his philosophy is really just Freudian psychologizing. <laughs> like that, that's what it read like to me. It's like uh, uh, Socrates. Well, well, no, no. That's yeah, what right. he was doing. You know, like uh, that, that's what it seemed like. I mean, is that a, an unreasonable way to look at his philosophy? Perhaps the more reasonable way is that mm. Freud is just Nietzscheanism. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be, from a timeline perspective, more accurate, mm. right? In fact, mm. the quote I shared in the lecture mm. is Freud said, Freud said, I ought to stop reading Nietzsche lest mm. I be left with no original insights of my own. <laughs> so so, so uh, Freud was deeply influenced by Nietzsche, so I'm not surprised at all that, mm. that you read into that. And the only correction I would make is really who's 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 the copycat of who <laughs> well it's it's such a common thing nowadays where um you know if you're not able to like a reporter's not able to get a um an interview with trump for example and they will psychologize the heck out of like whatever he's doing he's like doing this because of this or that and they'll assign right. motives where honestly there's not much evidence and it it, it really kind of does seem like that nihilistic battle power of will or I mean battle of wills or something like that um, that that you were describing uh, rather than sort of like rational discourse but I mean perhaps maybe that's that's his position that there is no rational discourse that it, it is all sort of like power dynamics and you know whoever is stronger wins so so Nietzsche th does think that reason can make certain progress one mm -hmm. example is let's say you desire equality um, uh, and you love Bitcoin at the same time. <laughs> Reason can show you Bitcoin's Gini coefficient. <laughs> and it, it appears that you, you should probably give up one or the other. So, so mm. it's stuff like that. Does, does that make sense? So, so mm. Reason can make a lot of imminent moves. Now, the difficulty here is that Nietzsche actually thinks that illusions are necessary for life. So he's willing to, to, to entertain the idea that, that even this type of truth, where I show you, you like equality, you like Bitcoin, but you just, you just cover your eyes and, and keep on going at it. If it's better for your life to do it that way, I, I think Nietzsche would be open to that possibility. But anyways, to answer your question directly, what, what Nietzsche is saying is, is a raw battle is, is these underlying values, right? Like mm. equality versus elitism. I, I don't think Nietzsche think. I think Nietzsche thinks that you can give reasons for these mm. things, but being able to give reasons for things is very different from being able to fully convince someone or ground something fully on reason. And mm. it, it does turn out, if you read modern philosophy, that mm. it's very hard to ground something like equality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there, there ha there's, there's been no knockdown sort of arguments, right? It's just people giving different reasons for, for, for equality, but none of them are, of course, the same goes with elitism, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, uh, this is where, I, I guess as a Christian, I, I, I sort of part ways with Nietzsche's, like way back at the beginning, once you reject God, and to me, he's admirable because he takes sort of like that enlightenment idea of, let's keep Christian morality without God um, and takes it to its logical conclusion. You have to reject one or uh, if you reject one, you have to reject the other. Um, and this is where, you know, he gives the whole God is dead speech. And it's like you've untethered from the sun. What, what shall we do? And, you know, goes into sort of like mourning about it. Um, but, you know, we, we've been talking about sort of his perspective as a way to talk about envy. And the way he talks about this battle of ideas, it, it really does seem like, you know, it's, it's a fight, uh, right? Like there, there's, um, and that envy is almost like natural or like a part of the motivation that's there to sort of like battle it out. And, um, and, you know, maybe, maybe the battlefield is the right sort of place to duke this out rather than in words or whatever. But, you know, how, how, what, what is Nietzsche's like, perspective on envy and how, how do we use it to yeah. help ourselves, I guess? Yeah, yeah. I think those are great questions. The first thing I'll, pro I'll probably... Hold on. Let me think about a response here. Um, so 
I think you are getting at something very interesting and unusual about the conclusion Nietzsche draws from anti-realism, right? This mm -hmm. idea that fa moral valuation is about su subjectivity mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. not objective is usually when people argue for moral subjectivity, mm -hmm. um, the, the conclusion is the position of tolerance, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the idea is, look, look, if I desire e equality, you desire elitism, you know, my, it's just my taste, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not right and you're not wrong. And so I should be a bit more tolerant about your desires. Mm -hmm. That's the natural conclusion people draw, or, or at least the contemporary conclusion. But Nietzsche draws the exact opposite conclusion. Mm -hmm. He says, well, look, if morals are subjective, and if reason is not going to be able to get at the bedrock of these moral valuation, then we must use force. <laughs> right, and so it is a battleground analogy. And let me be clear here: by force, uh, he can mean either, or I could have meant either mm. physical force. Right, for example, mm. a civilization triumphing in war and mm -hmm. having their values passing on that way. But again, it could also mean rhetorical force. It could also mm. mean instead of convincing you through pure flawless logic, it's through aphorism it's through shock right this is why Nietzsche writes in the way he does why he paints caricatures of people why he's you know is being unfair to a lot of his opponents right like making these fun names he's kind of like Donald Trump <laughs> of philosophy where he <laughs> makes these ridiculous names for people he, he doesn't like and yeah so, so that, that that's the question that sorry mm -hmm. that's the and that's the answer to your first question is that it, it mm -hmm. does really but de degenerate into a sort of battleground instead of a sort mm -hmm. of rational di discourse now what can we take away? That, that's your second part of the question. Mm -hmm. What can we take away from Nietzsche's understanding? I think the first thing that we should take away is that what we are envious of tells us a lot about what we really desire, right? Mm. So, for, for example, there are some people who are very envious of people who are rich but are, you know, unconcerned with someone who is famous. And there are some people who are the reverse, right? And the first thing to say is, if you get triggered a lot by people who are famous versus rich or rich versus famous, that, that tells you a lot about what your priorities are. And so I think we would want to go even one step further. Not only is what you're envious of tell you a lot about what you desire, I think what you are, what you say you dislike might also tell you. Um, a lot about what you desire, right? This negative push away, like in my case, it was, you know, technology, you know, mm -hmm. blockchain bad in 2017. Um, but in terms of positive prescription, what should we do? Again, Nietzsche thinks that uh, he's mostly concerned writing for higher men, creative geniuses, right? <laughs> and he thinks that for these people, he wants to um, relieve them of Christian morality, of egalitarianism. He wants to say, whatever you're envious of, um, don't turn that around and it's back. And let's say you desire rich to be rich. Don't say, you know, that's actually bad. We should be, we should, we should poverty. That's a virtue, right? This is what he thinks the Christian, the Christians do. Nietzsche would say something like, you know, embrace that, embrace that, and fully, fully express that if you are one of these higher men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that d d does that make sense? Like, I, th mm -hmm. I think the practical takeaway here is. Um, don't do a judo move on yourself with your own values. Don't use your values to gain, to, to, to secure a sort of spiritual psychological victory, but actually lose what you actually desire. Um, I'll give one last mm. example here. Um, Aesop's fox, right? Wants mm. the grapes, can't get the grapes, says, you know what? The grapes are sour anyways. I never wanted them in the first place. I think that the big learning is don't be like Aesop's fox, okay? <laughs> if you if you failed at something and you're envious of people who succeeded there, maybe that just tells you you should you should try harder, yeah. Instead mm -hmm. of turning that evaluative scheme around. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and that reminds me of something that a lot of you know Bitcoiners say, like stay humble, stack sats. Um, the idea being, a lot of people stray into altcoins because they're envious of Bitcoiners and okay, this is going up faster. Maybe I can catch up instead of doing that and then wrecking yourself and go, you know, like being bitter for the rest of your life, just more on the imitation side than trying to, um, I don't know, pass your friend or something like that. 
Um, and the, I, I, to be clear, I think this is great advice for the people that are, I guess, lower on the totem pole or just getting started or something like that. But how about for the people that have to deal with it from, you know, like I, I've been in it for a long time. There are lots of other people that have been in it for a long time. And there are friends and relatives that, you know, have envy. What, what's like any sort of practical advice that right. uh, that you can take away uh, from Nietzsche's philosophy with regard to envy in that, on that front. Yeah, I think in the modern economic view of man, right? This is Homo economicus. This is we, we just care about the absolute amount of goods or money or some objective metric, right? Pick some mm. object, objective metric. Um, the right thing to do is to give them money, right? Mm. Because <laughs> now they have more money and they should be happy because you gave it to them. There are so many examples in history where giving things to someone you thought would help created even more envy and resentment <laughs> and led, it, led them to ultimately seek revenge, sometimes killing the gift giver. So that is something that I'm not going to say you shouldn't do. I'm going to say you should, even if you do, you should do very, very carefully because what you don't want is in your desire to resolve that envy on the material realm to create that envy in the social realm. And remember back to what I said about what envy tells us about human, human nature is that envy means that we're social creatures. So the social mm -hmm. is going to be a lot more important than the material. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, now the question is what to do. Um, this, is just, this is not Nietzsche. This is just me <laughs> spitballing off Nietzsche. <laughs> One thing I think that could work is if you made yourself seem a lot weaker. Mm -hmm. So one example you could do is let's say you have a family member who's a lot less, less successful than you are. Mm -hmm. um, if you could pull off, uh, pull this off in a very sincere way to show the amount of scars and the failures and how you're not really satisfied by your mm -hmm. outward material success, I think mm -hmm. that would reduce some of that envy. Because again, right, what, what envy is, is a, is a fundamental jealousy that you possess mm -hmm. a good that they don't. If you're able to make yourself seem less good, less successful, less X, Y, Z, whatever they're, they're jealous of, again, that also has to be done tastefully. Mm -hmm. Now, the, again, that was me spitballing. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche's uh, solution. So, you know, if people mm -hmm. aren't appalled enough by Nietzsche, I'm going to add one more <laughs> thing about his theory. He's, he, he, he doesn't believe we, we – he thinks humans are – a lot more shaped by nature and genetics than mm -hmm. we do in 21st century democratic societies. He mm -hmm. thinks that there are people who are naturally slavish, naturally envious, and naturally masterly, naturally noble. And mm -hmm. Nietzsche would say that there are some people who are so sick, and he, he uses that word, that you just got to stay away from them. Mm -hmm. And he says that these people, whatever comes in their orbit, they just try to tear down and turn around in their values, like I was describing how to say blockchain back technology bad. And so Nietzsche would just say, you just got to stay away from the sick. The strategy is a quarantine model. So I suppose there are certain people in your life, and that's a judgment for everyone to make, where they're so sick that you, their nature is not going to change. And you being close to them is only going to make is going to make you sick as well. Mm. That's, uh, that's very good practical advice because I think too many people try to change other people <laughs> and when in fact uh, you know if they are that way the best thing you can do is just sort of go away and not give them a target of envy or uh, or jealousy um, the other one like sort of pretending to be weak um, it's a very interesting idea uh, and I, I'm I'm surprised that that's uh, that's something that you that's would think me. Nietzsche that's would that's, say. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I'm saying that that's me spitballing. That's me <laughs> okay. building off of the, of the theory. I, I don't think Nietzsche would say that at all. Um, yeah. And let, let me tell you why I, 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 think, <laughs> I think that. Um, whenever I, I'm, I have a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one with a friend who's very successful that I might go into the conversation envious of, every time they reveal to me their subjective turmoil, um, it often reduces that envy because what envy is is you have something that I don't. And again, it's usually not the objective thing. 
It's mm. you have a lot of money that makes you happy and I don't. It's not just you have money that I don't. And often when you share a lot of these more vulnerable sides, maybe that's the less Machiavellian way to put it. The more mm. you're able to share your vulnerable side, your, your weaknesses, um, mm. that will sort of diffuse that type of, that type of tension. Um, mm. Yeah. So mo money, mo problems. Um, go sing that song a little bit more or something like right. that. Okay. Well, so let, let's talk about the other philosopher that you mentioned earlier, uh, Rousseau. And uh, he, he's very different from Nietzsche in the sense that Nietzsche is all about the aristocracy and sort of uh, accentuating the differences and uh, giving resources to the people that would rule and so on. Uh, Rousseau comes from the exact opposite direction. His, his premise, more or less, is about equality. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about him and why, why you decided to study him, of all, all people? Yeah, right. So uh, Rousseau was um, an Enlightenment thinker, or more precisely, a thinker writing during the Enlightenment, <laughs> but he, who, who, was, he, who was himself very dissatisfied with um, the emphasis of reason. Um, mm. and science that the Enlightenment with, uh, held so high. And in that regard, he is very, very similar to Nietzsche. So mm. um, maybe one thing I'll say that's interesting for both thinkers is before I really delve into these thinkers, I, I have the same view that you have, right? Which mm. is there's the centrist thinkers, right? And that's people like Kant and Hegel. And then there's people on the right, aristocratic, mm. right wing, and that's Nietzsche. And then there's people on the left, and that's Marx, that's Rousseau. But the more you study Nietzsche and Rousseau specifically, the more you see that there are a lot of great similarities between them. Um, most mm -hmm. notably, that they are all against, um, in some strong sense, the Enlightenment, <laughs> against the sort of <laughs> rule of reason that we have now. When you read a bit closer, Rousseau doesn't appear to be a radical egalitarian that you might think. So he is against bad forms of hierarchy, but when Poland, but the, the advice he gave Poland was to create a, essentially a public competition where there's a hierarchy of competition where citizens compete to do virtuous acts, and through that competition, you can end up in the monarchy. You can be the monarch. You can sort of climb this, this hierarchy. So Rousseau is not a, a radical egalitarian in the sense that he wants to flatten anything. Um, and when you read what Rousseau has to think about heroes, um, there, there, there was this un, unwritten treaties discourse on, on heroes. It sounds to, it's, 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 it starts to sound a lot uh, like, like Nietzsche. So I think mm. these two authors are closer than you might think. In fact, uh, Nietzsche, before his association with the Nazis, made him untouchable for a few decades. Um, <laughs> basically, there was a feminist Nietzsche, believe it or mm. not. There was basically everyone who was unhappy with modernity. There was aristocratic <laughs> Nietzsche. Everyone who was unhappy with modernity rallied to sort of Nietzsche before the Nazis sort of um, co-opted his, his, his legacy for a few decades. Um, mm. So these two thinkers are a bit closer than you think. Now, mm. the question is, why Rousseau? Um, mm. Rousseau attracted me for very similar reasons that uh, Nietzsche and Girard attracted me, which is his emphasis on the social side of man and mm. what, what the key idea in Rousseau um, that describes that is called amour propre mm. there's no really good way to translate this into into English um, and it's a complement of the term amour de soi so amour de soi is base self-interest so if you want to eat if you want shelter um, the sexual urge basically what you what, what we share with animals now, amoprop are all the social goods we desire. It's a desire for recognition. It's a desire for esteem and praise and vanity and status and prestige and things like that. And Rousseau's um, big innovation, uh, or sorry, rather, and what I take from Rousseau is that m many things that we think are motivated by amour de soi, right? Um, mm -hmm. Take fine dining, for example. Allegedly, mm -hmm. that's for food. But we all know that fine dining is not has very little for most people to do with actual food. It has to do with the type of status that, that, that you get by being served in such a delicate way. And so Rousseau, much like Gerard, is able to um, reveal a lot of the secret mechanisms of the social world that pretend to be another mechanism. 
And unlike, I think, both Gerard and Nietzsche, he gives a lot more relevant prescriptive advice about how to deal with amour, amour propre, right, mm. um, than, than both Gerard and Nietzsche. So that's why um, Rousseau really attracted to me. But envy is also something um, fundamental to, to his theory as well. Yeah, I, the, the part that, uh, at least listening to your lecture, that, that really kind of turned me off, I think also turned you off. It, it's this idea, okay, there, there's some state of nature where, you know, things are uh, equal or something like that. And that's just completely idiotic, economically speaking, <laughs> like that never happened. And I, I don't know, he, like, uh, as somebody that's uh, studied Austrian economics and stuff, he sounds like an economic retard, right? Like just uh, like MMT... Bernie Sanders, bro, kind of like just somebody that knows nothing about economics, just asserting things for the sake of asserting, which, which is, you know, before when we were talking before the show, we, uh, I was saying how he seemed to me like a predecessor of Marx and Marx is exactly the same way. He just sort of makes assertions about things without like no uh, any evidence or any reasoning or anything. Um, and for me like that that that's like a giant turnoff so like why should we listen to any of the other stuff that he's talking about because right. in a sense his premises seem completely off um but i don't know is there anything of value still uh left in his philosophy even right. with that major error yeah so maybe i'll uh mm -hmm. preface or I'll wait to give my answer, um, but, uh, but I'll, I'll ask you a question first. When you, mm. when you say that you think the state of nature is economically mm. unsound, um, mm. what do you, yeah, can you elaborate there on, on how, do you, how do you think it's Well, unsound? so he, he, his uh, sort of premise seems to be that there was some state of nature where people were equal, more or less, and they didn't have scarcity. And we know from economic or just everyday life that there's always History, scarcity. right. There, there, and... Of even the stuff that you uh, you know you you describe as sort of like the base human needs, uh, you know, food, shelter. I mean, like, talk to anyone in New York City right now about shelter. Yeah, you can't find it for any affordable price. The, of course, there's scarcity. Uh, there's scar there's scarcity of food all over the place. Anywhere there's a famine, of course. Um, but he seems to assert this sort of um, natural abundance, right? Yeah, some natural, like, um, you know, state of being where scarcity was never a problem or something like that, which we know is not true. In fact, like one definition of economics is the study of scarcity and what you do about it and how you bring about abundance. It's usually through human labor and so on. Um, he seems to have no clue about it, what any of that means. And for me, it's very easy to dismiss them just on that one point. So you right. know, I, I, I guess that's, that's my justification. Yep. Um, so that is the common uh, intuition. Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. for our audience, the lecture you're referring mm -hmm. to is a lecture on the second, lecture on the second mm -hmm. discourse, which we're going to release a few weeks from now. And mm -hmm. it's one of Rousseau's most important works that details his understanding of the origin of inequality. And uh, the second discourse is essentially structured as a, what he calls a hypothetical history, which mm -hmm. appears to give a telling of how civilization came to be. Mm -hmm. um, now, the one assumption or intuition that I'm going to upheave here is that Rousseau actually did not think, this is one interpretation by the way, the other scholars disagree with this, Rousseau does not think that the state of nature is something, is a place that necessarily always existed. Hmm. For Rousseau, what he's trying to do in the second discourse isn't to, isn't what our historians do when they study Rome, or even what Thucydides what was trying to do, which is purports to capture some kind of real state in the world. What Rousseau is really trying to do is something closer to physics. Um, what he's trying to do is to give a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is this. Let's break down human nature into its fundamental components, okay? The, 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 the basic building blocks of human nature. So you have institutions like private property and agriculture over here. You have technologies like metallurgy over here. And you have human drives like amo prop, amo de soi, right? The concern for recognition, the concern for basic material needs. And let's layer them one after the other and see what we get. And by, 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 by layering it that way, in a hypothetical thought experiment way, we can tell what effects are caused by what. Because remember, his whole purpose is to understand what the origin of inequality is. So what he's giving you isn't a real history, but what he calls 
a hypothetical history. Mm -hmm. And so the state of nature is the state where humans do not have amal prop, this mm -hmm. desire for vanity, for prestige. And what is interesting there is in that state, again, I think Rousseau, Rousseau thinks that state never happened because we always <laughs> have amal prop. And so what he's trying to show, though, is that if we didn't have amor prop, how few scarcity, how, how, how much less scarcity we would have in our world. Mm -hmm. The positive way to frame this is think about all the scarcity um, in our world today and how much of that is to satisfy our natural desires and how much of that is to satisfy those social desires. I mean, you mm -hmm. gave a great example of housing in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to live to survive mm -hmm. on the island, right? You can mm -hmm. live in literally any other place in the world. And so there's a lot of things in life where the scarcity seems to be because of the goods, but actually has a social nature. So that that's the point that Rousseau is trying to draw out. He's not mm -hmm. trying to give you an economic, a historical view of how things are. He's trying to give you um, a thought experiment. And this is why Kant would honor him as a Newton of the moral mm. world, um, mm. Newton of the, of, the, of the human sciences, that he's trying to outline these laws of human nature rather than to give you a descriptive account. Mm. Well, so what, what are some of these laws of human nature, um, particularly with respect to envy and you know, how, how do you deal with it? How do you uh, do something with it? Um, uh, you know, especially given that uh, this this other need, the Amon Prop, is something that uh, a lot of people have but won't acknowledge uh, in many ways. Uh, they they will deny it till they, you know, uh, till the cows come home, I guess. But like they they don't want to admit it. Um, like it, it's it's kind of what we see in normal human interaction. So what 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 can we learn from him on, on that front. So one of these laws, as you said, um, amor prop, it, mm. it, it's in many ways the, the, the central thing about, mm. about human nature. So what amor prop is, to be a bit more precise now, is a relative desire. And it's relative mm. in two ways. And again, this goes back to the fact that humans are relative and social. The first way it's relative is that amor prop is concerned with comparison. So I want to be better than you. I want to have more Bitcoin than you. Or it could be a desire to be equal, right? I want mm. to fit in to this new group of cool kids at school. Now, th that's pretty un easy to understand. There's a second way in which ammo prop is relative, which is that for me to satisfy my, my ammo prop, it requires you to hold an opinion of me. What I want directly is your opinion, is your affirmation. And that's very different from Amo de Soi, right? In Amo mm. de Soi, first of all, I don't care how hungry you are. I care about <laughs> how fed I am. Mm. And, and, and hunger is something I can satisfy my, myself. But, mm. but Amo Prop is something I need the social world to satisfy. Now, Rousseau basically thinks because this desire is something so core to society that we can't get rid of it. And even if we wanted to, we even if we could, we wouldn't want to, because he thinks that amor prop is responsible for many of the good things in life. So romantic love, he, right, or familial love, the love between husband and wife, he thinks is largely bound up with amor prop. So we, we wouldn't want to get rid of it because we would lo lose goods like that. So the question for Rousseau, and this goes back to what I was saying about he has a lot more relevant prescriptive solutions than Gerard or Nietzsche, mm -hmm. is how do we direct this drive? It's not how we get rid, of, get rid of it. It's not how we become less mimetic. It's how do we direct this drive? How do we align our desires for recognition and status and prestige for external validation with intrinsically meaningful pursuits? Hmm. And there are a lot of lo rules here, so to speak. And you know, th I, I did a whole lecture, like two hour lecture with one of the world's experts on this idea to talk about all of them, which we can link in the description. But the long short of it is, you need to know what from whom, when, and how you're receiving ammo props. So let me give you an example. Um, from whom is probably one of the most important. Um, I think you need, to care, you, you need to be very careful of who you train yourself uh, to delight, who, to, to care about their opinions. Mm. Um, so in, in, in academic life, 
Rousseau famously says that he wants to be honored. So he's unlike the people you're suggesting. Rousseau is very upfront. I want honor. Okay, I want honor, but I want the honor of wise men, and I want to be honored for hundreds of years. I don't want to pander to the fashions of the day. So that's one example. To only desire the respect of others whom you respect is one way to prevent Amal Prop from. From 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 pulling you in all, in all these directions, and I think that's a very practical example. If what you care about is impressing the random guy at a crypto conference, then you might have a very different investment strategy or, or different friend circle that, that you're going to cultivate. If you want to only impress and be be a part of an elite, I don't know, crypto group with all the wisest people in the industry. <laughs> then that's going to incentivize other behavior. So that is just one example of how AML prop can be properly directed. Mm. Right. So you, you, you have the, uh, you're talking about the respect of people that, um, that, that actually quote unquote matter. And, uh, and typically these are the people that are kind of famous, which, which is why, or rich or something like that, have something that you have. This is the very essence of envy. Um, so, in a sense, like, is the suggestion to be more generous with your approval or um, praise or something like that uh, so that maybe right. people aren't as envious? Right. So, so it's not, first of all, the recommendation I'm trying to give, give, give right, or that Rousseau would give is not about how to make others less envious. It's how to make sure your amal prop does not lead you astray. I see. And the, the other thing I want to slightly modify is... I agree with you. Um, mm. the, the, the advice, if you want to put it that way, is to only desire the, rec the r approval of people who matter. Mm. But what matter means is not mm. like the people who are really rich and successful. Mm -hmm. I think what matter means for Rousseau is people who have good judgment in your space, in your space mm. if that makes mm. sense. So mm. if I'm a philosopher and I think, I don't know, the academy is corrupt, I don't think that, but let's pretend I think that. Then even if all the tenure professors agree with, uh, give me approval, but I don't trust their opinions, that's still, even though they're the people who matter, that's not what Rousseau is talking about. Rousseau is talking about winning the respect of people whose judgment you respect or who you think have good judgment. And Jimmy, I think you can immediately see why that prevents Amal Prop from leading you astray. Mm -hmm. Which is, if you care about people's judgments who you don't think have good judgment, then you're going to do things to impress that less good judgment. <laughs> right? I mean, think about it like this. Let's say you're a tennis player and mm -hmm. you want to impress the average Joe in the street. What are you going to start doing? You're going to start doing between the legs, behind the back shots. You're going to start doing fancy trick shots. But if you want to impress the world's best tennis coach, you're going to have to play the game the best way it's played. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? So mm -hmm. th that's one way of aligning external validation to the internal logic of, of the pursuit itself. Mm -hmm. So there, there's something that I guess we all do to impress the wrong people. I, I, I think I, yep. I heard a quote a while back about like uh, doing a job you hate for, or, you know, to impress people you don't like or something like that. And that, that tends to be sort of like a trap that a lot of people get into with respect to, I guess, their career path or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, with respect to the people that are envious of you, once you get into those positions, I, I, like, should you take it as a compliment? They think you have, like, the, val <laughs> the right values or they, they look up to you in some way? Like, ha um, I, I don't, maybe that's, like, a healthier way to look at it, but it, it still doesn't really solve the problem of envy, right? Like. Right. The, the, the problem of other people envying you, you mean? Mm. Yes. Right. Well, I'm, again, I, I don't think this is, this might be Rousseau. I, I'm pretty mm. sure it's not Rousseau. I'm, this is me, me spitballing. I mm. think the pretend to be weak thing could mm. also work here with Amal Prop. Mm. Because, again, what Amal Prop here is relative comparison, right? Mm. I have five Bitcoin, you have eight Bitcoin. <laughs> and I'm jealous. Well, you're not supposed to it, tell anybody, it, I think, yeah. for a good it, reason, it, for, <laughs> for this exact reason. Uh, exactly, but, yeah. Ex exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> However, ambiguity is also giving off signals. 
Mm. If you don't tell people how many Bitcoin you have and you're driving around in a Rolls Royce to different Bahama yacht trips, then, you know, people mm -hmm. are going to be able to guess. And so, again, maybe, and this is why old money is so low key, right? Mm. Maybe one of the reasons that old money can stay old or can stay, <laughs> stay young for a long time is that they don't attract that type of envy by being mm. more low key. Now, um, I think there's another uh, Rousseauian insight that might be able to help our close friends um, mm. and family which is that Rousseau thinks there's two types of recognition, very loosely speaking, that we mm. desire. Um, they're not fully commensurate. It's not like you can just get one without the other, but there is mm. somewhat of an economy between them. So if you get, if you get nothing of one, you're going to really desire the other in, in bad ways. And mm. the two different types of recognition is respect and esteem. Mm. So respect, Rousseau thinks, is some kind of uh, recognition given to you based on the fact that you are a human or that you are part of a certain group. It's not based on your unique characteristics. So, Jimmy, I go in the street and I do not mug you mm. because okay. you are a fellow uh, because you are a fellow human creature. Um, and mm. that's not something I, I, I that's not how I treat fellow human creatures. But I go on the street and I say, wow, you had a great podcast with Jonathan. That is esteem. That is something that you're given for your unique personal uh, personal uh, qualities. Does that mm -hmm. comparison make sense? So respect mm -hmm. is more about equality. It's more about generally um, uh, re respecting what, what a human being ought, ought to be respected. And then esteem is more about um, praising you. It's comparison. And it's mm -hmm. a lot more about that uh, your unique attributes rather than the general fact that you're a human. So mm -hmm. one way to get, I think, people less envious and desiring of esteem is mm -hmm. to satisfy them with respect, right? Mm -hmm. That... Um, you treat them with respect that they are a good and dignified person and for your kids for example don't create a family as atmosphere where the only way you're going to win recognition is by getting a good grade that there should be some kind of baseline love that you know dad's going to love you no matter what's going to happen as a baseline and so that's perhaps another solution which is um if people are too envious that could be a sign that they're not getting enough respect hmm. So uh, I guess what, one way you can deal with this is you can sort of show them that they, <clears throat> well, first, like sort of a baseline of being kind to a lot of people, which is completely the opposite of maybe what Nietzsche would say. Uh, but, but then uh, uh, in addition to that, maybe some level of esteem that you look up to them in some way is a good way to sort of like neutralize the envy that they yeah, might have yeah. towards you. Yeah, that, 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 that would be, a, that's a great example. So <laughs> I think the insight from Rousseau is that mm. amour prop is almost you can think about it like a currency mm. and uh just like gold and and and, and mm. silver are currencies mm -hmm. and maybe mm. gold is esteem silver is respect and mm. if you take away fully one people mm -hmm. are going to really desire the other and mm. like you said you can plug in gold to them <laughs> so that they desire less esteem and, mm. and become less envious. I'm probably stretching the analogy here, mm -hmm. but what, what I'm trying to do is add a theoretical framework to, to what you just said, which is mm. you can esteem them and that's mm. going to satisfy what is driving their amal prop and driving their envy. And maybe mm. that, will, that will reduce them. So even if they're not as rich as you, maybe you say, man, I, I really admire how fit you are or mm -hmm. how, how, how many books you've read or something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's another way to neutralize this. I, although I will say, and you're going to like this either, um, mm -hmm. Rousseau, much like Nietzsche, also is an advocate of distance. Mm -hmm. So Rousseau, uh, towards the end of his life, motivated by many reasons, but one of which was his own ammo prop, his, his own envy and his own pride and how it was inflamed, left, mm -hmm. left society. In fact, he wrote a book about it called The Reveries of the Solitary Wanderer. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, Again, I, 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 unfortunately, I think distance is the most surefire way to uh, to protect it, to prevent envy. <laughs> distance. Uh, well, uh, that that all makes sense. Uh, the, the the key insight, I guess, of Rousseau is that there there uh, the respect, the status, whatever you want to call it, is a human need and. The envy is there because they don't, they're not having their needs met in some way and perhaps like satisfying it in some way in some small measure, obviously you can't do it all by yourself, um, sort of helps to mitigate that.
that would be the nice answer. <laughs> yeah, that would be the nice <laughs> answer. But I, I will say one thing though, which is that I don't think Rousseau thinks, even if they live in a perfect environment where, where mm. they're getting a lot of respect and esteem, mm. I don't think that's going to remove envy completely. And again, I don't mm. think he wants us to, to to for all envy to be removed in society, because mm. again, envy and competition is what drives a lot of the goods we have, including the drive to be virtuous. Rousseau thinks is partially determined by our desire as wanting to be seen by others as being virtuous. So something that's clearly good, which is cultivation of virtue in public life, has at is, as its one, one, one of its core drivers, amor prop. Um, mm. However, and this goes back to what, what I was trying to say, there are healthy and unhealthy versions of amor prop's inflammation. And mm. one reason for an unhealthy version of inflammation is because they're not getting any respect whatsoever and there's not, they're not getting any esteem. So they, they're envy might be extremely exaggerated and so you might be able to calm that envy down maybe even turn it into a healthy envy um, by providing that to them mm. well I, I mean i the the problem i see here is that you're only like one person and generally when of of when course. you're looking for esteem or respect it's from a lot of people sort of, of like of course and it's it's a very rel i mean the the way you uh, describe animal prop it it, it at least for me, the way I thought of it is like this giant status game and the people at the bottom of the status game just aren't happy because they're not, it's a zero sum game. All status games are. So you, you're near the bottom. They're not happy. You know, like they, uh, there's not much you can do to bring them up past a little bit of what you're able to pull. Um, it, it seems kind of like a... Right. A, like uh, a pointless game at that point like you're not right. going to be able to do much about it so two things the first thing mm. is one of the questions you asked me was mm -hmm. friends and family like mm. my friends and family are becoming jealous and that is where you do have a lot more pull right mm. um, and the second thing I want to say however is that your intuitions are fundamentally right mm. which is why Rousseau doesn't think that resolving Amo Prop's bad uh, mm. manifestations is an individual project it's a societal mm. project one mm. example, for example, is having the right institutions in a society. Rousseau thought that rec institutions that recognize, and Hegel carried this on, institutions that recognize fundamental human rights mm. gave you that type of respect. So the institution of it gave that respect. Another institution that's extremely important for Rousseau is marriage. Mm. For the reason that marriage provides a constant source of esteem. When I decide to marry someone, it's not because they are a human, period, right? <laughs> it's because of some specific characteristics that they have, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and so marriage for Rousseau, especially monogamous marriage, confirms, confers a great deal of esteem. And this is why, for example, you see a lot of entrepreneurs and they get, very, they get a lot less motivated after they get married and they enter into a stable, long-term monogamous relationship is because they have that type of... Um, uh, Amal prop satisfied already, and so your exact your intuitions are exactly right. The problem of Amal prop going wrong is not a problem that individuals really can fundamentally resolve. It needs to be societal. That's interesting. I, I at least in my experience, I've seen that the you know after someone gets married, they tend to actually have a better career. Maybe the removal of MB can be. Um, Liberate sort of like a clearing sort of, you know, makes everything a lot clearer about uh, where to go and what to do and so on. And instead of being sort of blinded by envy and looking through everything through green colored glasses or something like that. Yes, that, 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 that's what I meant to say. It's not mm -hmm. that it, mm -hmm. it's not that um, marriage tends to reduce one's destroy one's career, mm -hmm. although that obviously sometimes does happen. <laughs> it's more that uh, marriage provides a constant and stable source of amal prop, especially mm. of esteem. And so mm. that lessens your drive for... Or at least a good um, marriage would. I don't know if... Yeah, a good marriage would. Yeah, a good marriage would. Um, okay. And so a lot of entrepreneurs are, are driven by, by esteem, right? So, so in that case, they would be lessened. But Yeah, I, unfortunately, that a lot of... Uh, uh, so, all right, let me ask it this way. Um, how much of uh, the current 
you know, current society's motivations, like, uh, you know, the, all, the, all the people that are trying really hard to get into college, for example, or become, or get a job at one of the top tier law firms or a job at a, you know, a top tier management consulting company or becoming an investment banker. Like, th those all seem like places where um, Amon Prop is a major driver of why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, yeah, what percentage of society do you think, like, or wh how much of society uh, benefits with that versus how much is sort of like destructive as a result of that? Like, and is it imbalanced right now? Is it more destructive, more creative? What, what, what's your instinct on how it, how it is right now? So Rousseau says um, to this drive, he's talking mm. about frenzied amour propre in, in mm. civilization, which is what we have now. Mm. We owe our conquerors um, and our philosophers, but we, all, we owe our scientists and our progress, but we also owe, owe all of our errors. Mm. So amour propre is something that is so central to humanity that we owe to, 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 to Rousseau almost everything would be unimaginable without amour propre. That's how deeply mm. it penetrates. But the answer for Rousseau is that it's mostly negative. Um, and mm. this is why Rousseau had the intuition of the noble savage, right? And why Rousseau <laughs> does critique civilization. Rousseau does not think he's one of the biggest critics of this idea of progress, this enlightenment idea of progress. He does not think that on average, um, or rather on net, we are getting better. Um, in fact, mm. even he, he gives the example of how certain diseases that are completely unknown in the times of Ho in, in the times before homer become commonplace in europe of his day and so mm. now rousseau does not advocate a return and he's very explicit about that if you read the footnotes but mm. he does think it's overall negative that mm. it doesn't really add to our happiness and most of it is things like keeping up with the kardashians mm. Well, it's interesting because I, I see so many sort of like proto-Marxist ideas. Um, and I, I think you would say that Marx got a lot of his ideas from Rousseau. Yep. Uh, but a lot of the Marxist program is very much in line with eliminating this I'm on prop, this envy, this, uh, this very unhealthy sort of human desire. Um, and... But, you know, the, the sad thing, of course, is that it, none of those institutions actually eliminate any of it. Uh, it. It actually gets worse under communism or something like that. Yeah. So I agree with you that Rousseau deeply influenced Marx. Um, Can you speak closer into the mic? Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I agree with you that Rousseau deeply influenced Marx. Um, I, I, I haven't thought about this too... But, but but my intuition is that Marx did actually actually did not pick up a lot of what Rousseau tried to capture with Amo Prop. Mm -hmm. um, one of the top professors whom I interviewed described it this way: He's both a Nietzschean and a Marxist, or, or rather, <laughs> it, rather he's a scholar, a top scholar of both Nietzsche and Marx. Mm -hmm. And in, intuitively, you're like, well, how can that be? Right? One is on mm -hmm. traditionally on the right, one is traditionally on the left, and he says that they're a good complement to each other that Marx has no psychology and all structure, right? It's all about mm -hmm. societal structures and, whereas Nietzsche is all, all psychology, as you mentioned, and no mm -hmm. structure. So mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that Marx took away a lot of the insights about Amor Prop, um, but he did take away, obviously, uh, Rousseau's suspicion of, of inequality and his uh, attack of, of, uh, of, of uh, of, of, of a sort of a mer mercantile life, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the, the two guys that you mentioned, Nietzsche and, and Marx, um, Nietzsche is sort of like father to, you know, uh, Freud, and Freud, Freud and Marx are the two parents of the Frankfurt School, which is basically what is causing the craziness that we're, we're seeing all around us, everything that you kind of see as woke is pretty much from that school. So, um, you know, I, I'm not surprised your professor is is sort of studying both of those because it's it has so much to do with uh, the modern day. Okay, um, 
Well, so we're 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 over an hour at this point already. Uh, but uh, what what other insights, if any, do you have from studying these two? Um, and perhaps you can uh, include Gerard in this thing. Um, uh, and what message would you have for Bitcoiners that that are experiencing some of this stuff and like, how it's likely to resolve uh, as as right. things get you know crazier? I guess over the next yeah. uh, next few years. I'll add the. Um I'll add Gerard's sort of uh, helpful insight here, mm. which is that for Gerard, envy, jealousy, desires traffic much easier through similars than mm. people who are different, which is unintuitive. You'd think that uh, the more different I am from you, the more cause you have to be envious. But here, here's an example. Your community probably isn't jealous of Elon, even though Elon has a gazillion more dollars than you do. <laughs> But 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 you pro you're probably jealous of someone who's very much like you, but a bit bit better off, right? Mm. And so this is Gerard's core insight that it is similars that are uh, that create envy, because desires traffic much easier among similars. Mm. So again, the advice here, you're not going to like it again, is going to go back to the advice of distance. <laughs> for for Rousseau, that distance was physical distance. For Gerard. Um, one way to stop envy from flowing in society is physical difference. Uh, sorry, is social difference. Mm. So caste systems, for example, for Gerard, um, had the if it's even if even if it's overall negative and anti-Christian for Gerard, um, had the overall positive effect of limiting envy amongst different castes. Mm -hmm. And there's a more palatable way to do this even in, in modernity, which is. Um, to conceive of yourself as a very different person than who you're envious of or who is envious of you, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, I, I've had two careers uh, at this point, uh, one, or two, two attempts at careers at this point, <laughs> one in the um, intellectual space, so to speak, with Gerard and now this lecture series, and another building a, a tech company. And what's nice about um, being in these two spheres is that I can always diffuse uh, envy or diffuse my own envy um, by being the other mm -hmm. in a conversation. So if I'm talking to an entrepreneur, I can be like, well, I'm, I'm an intellectual, so there's no competition between us. And if I'm talking to an intellectual, I can do the opposite. Now, this can have the negative coping effect that Nietzsche warned us about, right? You're kind of just distancing away so that, so that you, you don't lose. But it can also have a nice distancing effect where no one feels threatened by the other person. Um, mm -hmm. So, again, Gerard's advice here and the common thread amongst all these three is distance. Uh, distance, <laughs> fundamentally, is what diffuses envy. And if you ask how that, how that works um, in pra people's practical lives about this Bitcoin and the next cycle, again, people aren't going to like it. It's literally just physical and social distance is to not conceive of yourself and not advertise yourself as a Bitcoiner. Um, that would be the, the social dif distance. And the second one is just to not be so engaged in these communities. That's the mm -hmm. physical distance. And at the end of the day, I think that's the more, most reliable strategy um, against envy. Mm. So go hang out with people that are very different than you, I guess, or something like that, and uh, sort of uh, not, not give them reason to... Um, get envious of you uh, or if you or keep distance with the people that are most likely to be infected uh, by your um, success, I guess, or become envious of your success. Yeah. Or, 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 or let me put it, put this another way. Um, so you're, you're in the Bitcoin um, community. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it helps just to be fully immersed in another community as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe for you, that's the cowboy hat collecting community <laughs> or, or something like that. And so that, Having another sphere, if you're, let me, give, let me put it this way. One of the reasons I found San Francisco so suffocating of a city to live in is because there's a single hierarchy, okay? It's the tech mm -hmm. hierarchy. I couldn't even take a surfing lesson without someone telling me about the Tesla stock. Mm -hmm. And that's suffocating because there's a clean pecking order. And wherever you stand on that pecking order determines your overall pecking order. <laughs> New York is nice because New York also has a pecking order. That's finance. But it has a lot of other status hierarchies around it, right? That's media, mm. fashion, tech, all these different things. Mm. And it's quite, there's a sort of ambiguity when you meet someone mm. of, of where one stands. And you don't feel like you need just to puff up your chest all the time in the way you do San Francisco. Because it's so 
zero sum is not the right word here, but it's so mm-hmm. hierarchical in San Francisco, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that, that's one example for Sam. But again, that's a form of distance, a social distance. So you are, you, you're not going to give up, you're not going to get rid of envy and be able to keep everything that you also have, I think is what I'm trying to get at. Mm. There, there's a trade-off to be made here. And it's, uh, it, it's interesting that you keep saying distance. Um, for me, that's, uh, that's, I guess, like a Bitcoin value of privacy or something like that. And that this is right. sort of like um, hiding yourself a little bit uh, from other people. Yeah, uh, and, and yeah. You know, a very good reason to have privacy. Yeah. You know, I, look, most people think of it as, oh, you're just trying to hide stuff that's illegal or something like that. No, sometimes you just want to yeah. not reveal things that will inspire jealousy or, or and, something like that. And Jimmy, I, I think in our last conversation on Gerard, you mm-hmm. compared to Satoshi to Jesus or something like that, right? <laughs> well, Where Sat- just... Satoshi withdrew in, in one mm-hmm. specific domain. Mm-hmm. And, and your claim, and it was a great one, and it stuck in my mm-hmm. head, was that one of Gerard's central claims is of why Jesus is important is Gerard mm-hmm. withdrew. Okay, mm-hmm. at the very moment, sorry, at the very moment that Jesus could dominate, mm-hmm. Jesus withdrew. When he came mm-hmm. back to life, resurrected, he, if he showed himself to Pontius Pilate, mm-hmm. everyone would be bowing at, his, bowing at his knees because we thought he would just killed this guy. Mm-hmm. But for Gerard, the very moment that Jesus could dominate, he went back up. Mm-hmm. And your observation then was that the founder of Bitcoin, Satoshi, also withdrew. He mm-hmm. wasn't someone who was public. And that's exactly, I think, what we're zeroing in on, in on here. Mm-hmm. Why did Satoshi withdraw? Why did he create social and physical distance mm-hmm. to prevent envy? Is probably mm-hmm. a big reason he did that. So that's, I think, what we're zeroing in on together here in this conversation. Yeah, and I, I, it gives me insight into the value of privacy. I think uh, for a lot of people, it's, uh, you know, it's very personal. But I think the argument that you're making through Rousseau and Nietzsche and uh, Gerard is that it's actually way more social. The the reason you want privacy is to keep the peace, right? It's it's to not allow violence uh, in in many ways. Uh, You know, the the more people know about uh, you, the the more sort of envious and jealous and violent they can be. Um, I think uh, somebody told me like... uh, every privacy leak is also a security leak. And I think uh, there, there's something profound about that where knowledge itself is enough to get people to act in yeah. ways that are very unhealthy. So um, when I was building the early stage startup, one of mm-hmm. the lines that we always used to say is that if we could take the equity table mm. of a startup and mm. send that as a PDF to everyone in the company, that would be like dropping a nuke in the org structure. Why is that? It's because, well, who are you going to look at? You're not going to compare yourself with people who you, got, who you have favorable terms to. Mm-hmm. You're going to look at one guy in the org chart and say, that guy who was joined two months before me and who does nothing, I can't believe he has three times more equity than I do. Mm-hmm. And so you're exactly right, Jimmy, is that privacy, and this is the really interesting uh, insight mm-hmm. that I, I, didn't, I didn't have coming into this conversation, but you made me realize mm-hmm. Privacy has social benefits, right? <laughs> privacy is a deeply social is a deeply social good, and that's mm. that, that's a very interesting insight. Yeah, and uh, and you know uh, there there's a lot of wisdom in that that we're still unpacking, I think, um, because it is very like a, a lot of these altcoins they they publish like who has how much, and it's, really? it's just like what are you doing? You're, you're just sort of inciting this envy among all of these other people, and they're trying to climb up this weird pecking order this uh you know making it a zero-sum game essentially and they fight over it and they don't they don't even realize that they're in this game and uh they they end up essentially going bankrupt trying to um climb it or something like that um whereas you know having privacy you know kind of keeping your head down doing your own thing and relating to people in a way that's kind of safe for other people to relate to you right. i think is is I'll, is a is a good value for I think Bitcoiners to have. Uh, I'll, I'll add a, one more example here that ties into this that made me mm. think of, which is that um, usually today we think of someone like a popularizer like uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy, right, or mm. Neil deGrasse Tyson, as, as as a good person, 
right? Because they're mm-hmm. trying to spread knowledge. And mm-hmm. an intellectual who's just writing to a few peers, well, that, that, that's selfish, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and this is what, we, what you were talking about, right? You see the corollary here, right? Be- between mm-hmm. the privacy of ideas and the privacy of assets, right? Mm-hmm. When, when the thing that you said that made me think of this is you said when people hear privacy, they think you're doing something wrong. Mm. Right. In the same way that if you have intellectuals who are only writing to a to a small minority, you think, why are you only writing to them? Why not <laughs> make it available to everyone? Mm. And again, Rousseau has a great answer here, which is that it's actually healthier for you to limit who you share things with, who you win mm. recognition from, to a small mm. group of people that you respect, than just blanketing it out there. And that's mm. another version of this, mm. which is that it's actually more virtuous to be less democratic, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah, in, instead of playing to the crowd, you're playing to the people that have to the, the same wise. values yeah. as you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, all, all, all very good lessons, and hopefully, um, you know, there's some, there's a lot of Bitcoiners that listen to this conversation start valuing privacy a lot more, right? Like, because uh, there Distance, are ways for your woods. friends to find out how much you have if you leave any crumbs anywhere. And, uh, and second, to sort of like conduct yourself in a way that's not going to inflate it, right? Uh, and, you know, instead of going and buying the flashy Lambo, uh, right? Like that's, that's sort of the mimetic thing to do. Um, uh, you know, go, go, you know, like sort of stay low key and learn the lessons of uh, maybe the old Satoshi. money people that, uh, that, that have been doing this for a while. Uh, and you know, act like you've been there before instead of uh, being sort of the new money person. Yeah. Um, all right. So when, when is this uh, series going to come out? Um, I, I think I'm supposed to try to coordinate with you. So I guess whenever this comes out, your, yours will be available. But what, what yeah. are your two, like, uh, your, what's your lecture series about and where can people right. find it? So I'm launching a lecture series starting off with Rousseau, uh, Nietzsche this week, Rousseau mm-hmm. next week um, that we discuss. Mm -hmm. Um, And the whole idea is um, I I give two hour lectures uh, that are comprehensive introductions on some of the most important ideas of the most important books in the Western canon. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if anyone watched my old Gerard lectures, it's it's in that style, but sort of a broader scope and it's on all the Western canon. So after Nietzsche and Gerard, we're going to do Nietzsche and Rousseau, we're going to do Shakespeare, we're going to go back to the ancients and do Plato and Aristotle and Homer. And so basically all the books that uh, you should have been taught in school, that, but that you weren't. Um, you're going to be able to digest them in a in a in a serious but accessible format. Um, and on top of that, I, I interview some of the world's leading professors uh, who study those books, and those are kind of deep dives. So you can find everything on my website, which is greatbooks.io. Um, and another place to find me is uh, Jonathan B on YouTube. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, go check check check, check go check that out. And do you, do you have any newsletters or anything that you want to promote yeah, as well? Great, greatbooks.io is just mm-hmm. is where my my email list will be. Um, mm-hmm. So so yeah. Oh, so do people need to read these books beforehand, or should they just listen and then go read them? What, what's your What's your recommendation? I think the, the the best way that I tend to engage with in, like helpful introductory material, like what, like hopefully what I'm producing, is you read it for you read my stuff first. You, wa- you read the book and then mm-hmm. you come back and, and watch it again. Um, mm. That's what I do for secondary literature. I, mm. I, I read the secondary literature first, then I read the main book, and then I revisit the secondary literature. And the reason you want to do it first is because the book itself is usually very, very dense and difficult to read, and you're most likely going to get lost um, if you don't have that guide. Um, and the, the reason you want to watch it again afterwards is... Um, it's going to bring up different things in the text that, 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 that you didn't realize. So that's how I usually engage with, with lectures like these. And so I hope it will be helpful for you, for everyone as well. And they're all free. Um, so that's the other thing. All right. So um, hopefully you guys can, uh, you know, get something out of this a conversation and use Jonathan's lectures and then go to the source material, then go to Jonathan's lectures again and then watch this. So, you know, it's sort of like layers of an <laughs> onion or something like that. I think that's how Tor works anyway. Anyway, um, uh, thank you for the conversation. It, it, it was really fun, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get to do it again next time you put out something new, and uh, we'll, we'll find some topic to talk about that's relevant to Bitcoiners. Awesome. Thanks, Jimmy. All right. All right. Play. Cool. 
Unchain Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or a Bitcoin native financial services partner, learn more at unchain.com.